This is a production of Cornell University Library. I'd like to welcome everybody in this room, and uh, this is a beautiful day and beautiful room. I've been at Cornell already for two weeks, I think, as a new extension associate, so I'm really happy to be back to Cornell because, well, this is a place where I've done my MS and PhD with Marianne Krasny, now I'm her colleague. I'm so thrilled to be here. But I'm also really happy to have you in this room. The, uh, just the fact that you are here shows that you care about the environment. You are some of environmental leaders or maybe teachers for your community or friends, uh, and you can spread the world, uh, word about the environment. Um, my name is, again, my name is Alex Kudryavtsev, but I also go by Alex Russ in publications, just to make it a little bit easier for those who cite my work. And uh, Marion Krasny has a, a convenient enough last name that she doesn't need to use a pen name. Uh, okay, so today, if you would like to remember just two lessons or like uh, something, what, you know, take home messages. I have two take home messages for you. First, remember, urban environmental education is taking care of cities to ma making them more sustainable and uh, environmentally friendly, friendly more for both people and for nature. And the lesson or message number two is that practically anyone can be an urban environmental educator. Professional teachers, educators, policy makers, city or urban designers, but also small kids, youth in schools, and you also can be, and maybe many of you are already, in urban environmental educators if you uh, do something for in environmentally friendly in cities and also discuss, for example, environmental issues with your friends or colleagues or with your family. Okay, uh, but I also want to tell you before I go into the book about my personal story, how, how I became an environmental educator and then researcher. So I grew up, uh, as Mary just mentioned, in Russia and specifically in Siberia. So when I was a little kid, I would take on a uh, car where we, in our family, we would drive a lot, like long distances from Siberia to Black Sea across many uh, time zones, but even like, for example, what it looks like to drive in Siberia. You get on the car, you want to go from your town to another town, and you will drive like on the road like this, or maybe not paved road, for two or three hours, no gas station, no another car, no another human, more chance to see a bear or elk, well, maybe it's an exaggeration, but still there's like no, uh, practically no people. So I thought my image of what the Earth, a planet, and is and nature is in the, in the childhood. I thought, okay, city or like cities and people make up only 0.00001% and 99.9999% of the Earth and what we see and experience is nature and wild nature. Um, well, it's still not far from truth in some parts of the world. So two weeks ago when I left uh, uh, my hometown of Tomsk in the city. I lived on the 14th um, floor of a 17th floor uh, building, apartment building. Uh, so in Russia, the cities are unlike in the US. You have huge development and you just step a few steps and you're in Taiga forest. You have a chance to see a bear or a moose or elk or some, something like that. So whereas in Ithaca, you just drive and you see, oh, there's a house here in the, among the fields and in some forest, etc. So. Uh, still there's like a big division. So moving on with my development from nature to more urban and uh, city areas. When I got to Cornell, uh, first for MS and then PhD, I did research, I conducted uh, uh, research, collected data from urban environmental education programs in some, in like a really opposite environment to what I used to be. Uh, what, uh, um, and this is uh, the Bronx, New York City, of some. Um, I don't block the, uh, I just want to make sure that I don't block the view. So the, some, one of the busiest areas in the world uh, and most developed. And so why did I go there? I worked with uh, or collected data in community-based organizations that organize all kinds of urban environmental education programs for community members, for students, for kids, young and small and big. So, and they involve those um, kids. How do they learn about the urban environment? They would uh, take 
stewardship activities like plant trees or restore oyster reefs in the river or maybe conduct some community activism. So all sorts of these ideas. When I went to those organizations, I lived in the Bronx more than two, year, two years, but um, I observed those kids and uh, conducted uh, surveys within a year, before or, and after a year of a program. So if you would ask those students at the beginning when they just enter EE pro environmental education program, like what does the Bronx mean to you? And they will say, oh, the Bronx is pollution, gangs, prostitution, um, uh, asphalt, asthma, like health problems, a lot of concrete and asphalt. So after a year, these meanings don't go away due to urban environmental education programs. However, they get other meanings attached to the Bronx. So after a year in these programs, these students will say, oh, the Bronx is actually a great place to observe birds. A Bronx is a great place to plant trees or go out with your family and friends and spend time in uh, uh, small pocket parks or larger parks or maybe participate in community gardening and being outdoors. So totally different meanings that were attached to what they've been experiencing. Uh, a great example, one of the community-based organizations for positive youth development, they got a, a grant from the city, collaborated with local government, and eventually they removed uh, debris, like or what remained from the post of old industrial site, a former concrete plant park, and they created a beautiful park on the bank of, uh, the, of the Bronx River, where community group members now go and uh, uh, have a lot of great time. Now, question for you. Uh, where you grew up or where you are from, from any cities, Ithaca or New York or elsewhere, what do those, uh, what are the meanings of those cities to you? What, what words, what, which adjectives or nouns come first? Maybe some, uh, as you describe those cities, maybe a, a couple of you can say, you know, what's your city and what are the meanings that you attach to those cities? Ecological or not? Mary. <laughs> Ah, uh, I am sorry. I don't know how big or uh, it small is it is. Uh, which I also <laughs> don't. Know. <laughs> oh, that's pretty big. Yeah. That's forty thousand bigger. Yeah. Mm. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I feel like people take pride in this fact, and there's yeah. like, wow, this is something that, some meanings that are attached. Yeah, Lucille Ball is also uh -huh. from Jason. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and this is an excellent example. Why? Because I just want to say that uh, place meanings, they can be attached to physical structures. You will say, like, what New York means to you? And you'll say, oh, Statue of Liberty, or maybe a High Line Park, or a Central Park, or whatever, right? And here there's meaning, meanings. Uh, somebody who just drive through the city, they will not know this, right? This is, uh, these meanings that are not, if, uh, don't have a physical structure, but they have a his historical meaning. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, you can transfer these uh, meanings through social learning by discussing, like how will a new generation of kids know that? By the stories that you tell them, by through uh, film, media, and books, etc., that will talk that these people worked and they're from this town and they developed this nice work. Uh, yes? So I grew up in Levittown, New York, which is a famous post-World War II suburb. And Mr. Levitt planted the same grass, same hedges, same trees in every single yard. Wow. There was absolutely no diversity. <laughs> wow, what an interesting example. Do you know what the reason what was the reason? Did he plant something like oh was it local at least? <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. Um, th and that's a great example of uh, a meaning that has a physical presence in the community. Excellent. Okay, but uh, after this Bronx experience uh, um, and so dealing with environmental issues, I broadened my perspective of urban uh, topics and development by taking a, world, a trip around the world for one year. And well, it, the trip actually never ended. I still can tra continue to travel sometimes to different places. But uh, I, I've got some really nice experiences. Like in Rio de Janeiro, 
uh, I went uh, to do actually a very similar presentation, bef maybe before this book, but we were kind of discussing whether we need to publish something like an earlier discussion. And I, I think I, I made a presentation in the Federal uh, University of Rio de Janeiro. And then their students took me on a journey to a favela, favela, some of the poorest and very da quite, quite dangerous neighborhoods. Um, students, university students, they organize uh, gardens, there was no any single green leaf in those favelas still. And they put those gardens and teach small kids and families how to grow vegetables in their backyards. Uh, so this sort of environmental education. Two months ago or three months ago, I've been in Seoul, South Korea. And this is really, really a famous example. I'm pretty sure many of you have heard about this, the Chonggachan River, which uh, like a really relatively small river that flows through the center of uh, Seoul. It used to be, uh, of course, in the p very past, like a, a, a natural area, then it was a traditional village. Then it was like a really urban development that you see on the left. Uh, they put a highway or maybe two layers of highway on that river. Nobody even knew that the river existed. Then they, uh, they lighted it, which means they uncover and they restored most of environmental features that this river used to have with birds and plants. Now many, so many families go and really love to go there and uh, take a walk and relax. Singapore taught me about uh, green infrastructure like these super trees in the gardens by the bay. They are collecting rainwater, uh, plants uh, on these um, uh, super trees. They probably uh, collect uh, some pollution or maybe reduce. So they have some ecological benefits for the environment and also teach people. When I got to London, King's Cross, the center of London, what can be more urban than that? Uh, huge railway stations nearby. Uh, I think Google is uh, building a huge office like also across the river there. And they have a former coal site, or like an industrial site where they uh, used to store coal. M just a regular norm, people from the community, they decided to build this uh, Kemli Street natural, natural Park with lots of native plants. And um, I ran into these uh, two ladies and they, I just talked to them and they said, oh, we just live here across the street. We love to spend their uh, time after work or on weekends and teach local kids about nature. It's amazing. So uh, in parallel, this was my personal history or like, yeah, story that uh, I go from my natural experiences into environmental disastrous sites where we try to solve environmental problems into more green infrastructure and green urban design ideas. In parallel to my personal development, there was an evolution of environmental education as well, quite similar to my uh, evolution. So we, also, we all at Cornell are so proud that 100 years ago we had a professor Anna Comstock. She, I would consider her one of the in contemporary words, she would be uh, a founder of an environmental education. Uh, at her time, we call, she called it, uh, and her colleagues called it nature study. And this was probably the first time when people realized that we can learn about nature out of doors. So that was really a revolutionary step. So a lot of nature. Uh, in uh, 19, 19, 1977, we had the intergovernmental conference uh, in, uh, where maybe many UN nations uh, participated and got this Tbilisi declaration where environmental education focused since then primarily on um, solving environmental problems uh, by modifying behaviors of, and attitudes of people through education. And now when we move to uh, today, these days, we've got so many diverse ideas in, uh, in urban in environmental education. Some people are taking care about still uh, taking kids outdoors and uh, looking at the health benefits. We also see ideas that uh, relate to using environmental education to achieve sustainability development goals. Um, many people are trying to connect environmental education with uh, stewardship activities. Uh, Marion Krasny published, for example, another book on civic ecology where uh, stewardship and environmental education are combined uh, and 
envisage each other. And me personally, uh, so far, I've been also interested in literature that concerns green urbanism, uh, green cities, biophilic cities. So they, this literature also enters the field of urban environmental education and informs us. In the, in the, the Civic Ecology Lab with Marian Krasny and our colleagues, to advance those ideas, our first uh, little steps were to produce some self-published e-books e uh, about this topic. So one of them was uh, based on my dissertation. We collected all narratives of educators and some students from the Bronx. The book is available online if you're interested to download it. Another book that we published, uh, we started, uh, uh, as Mary just mentioned, that Marianne is interested in uh, development and everybody in our lab, we develop online courses. One of them was on urban environmental education. We had as many people in that course as we have in this room probably, it was not a big course, but then we combined people like in groups of two or three and those educators, they wrote chapters and this little book about urban and environmental education. Also, you can download it from the web if you're interested. But it's still, you know, it was not really professional, homemade and uh, educators. We understood, we realized that there is a global community of environmental educators on all continents, except Antarctica maybe, uh, that who are interested in environmental education in cities. And they just sit there and spread out uh, in, around the world in their universities. Don't talk much about, uh, about this with, with each other, except rare conferences. We decided to put them together in an uh, online community and run a few webinars and kind of identify what are hot and big and interesting topics in urban environmental education that we need to advance. So we can present this book for students in universities, for volunteers and teachers in communities. And uh, eventually when we got a team of uh, 82 authors, they are mostly university professors from 19 countries, but and also some other experts in the field uh, who co-authored 30 chapters. Most of chapters we try to combine people from different continents, but unlike, I don't know if you edited or you've read some edited books that are multi-authored each chapter, usually each chapter is written by a team of people who know each other, like from one lab or they collaborate for a long time. We went a different way. We combined people from who never knew each other, but maybe shared an interest in some topic uh, so they can write a chapter that has more diverse views. For example, a chapter that's uh, about urban environmental education in developing, co developing countries. We had an author from uh, Brazil, from South Africa, and from India. Never met each other before this collaboration, but they wrote together a nice chapter. The book is for people like you who are interested in any, in broad, broadly in environmental issues, uh, who are community activists, who want to teach others in their communities and neighborhoods. They can, the book is, can be helpful and used as textbook in, with uh, uh, students in universities, as well as uh, can be useful by current and future teachers and environmental educators and volunteers. You want to look at uh, really briefly at the context contents. Uh, this, as I mentioned, there's 30 chapters, and they are divided in five groups. Uh, so first, we review the urban context. What the city? What does it mean to conduct environmental education in city? Uh, different uh, specific educational settings: non-formal, formal, then uh, theoretical uh, frameworks that inform this field who we need to educate because uh, environmental education is traditionally like about children, but we see that uh, educating adults and families in different groups also as important and educational approaches. So one of the chapters, the last chapter here on this list, educational trends. I'd like to look at it, at this chapter just a little bit more deeply so you will have a feeling what chapters look like and what they discuss. So in educational trends, uh, actually Marianne and I was, were uh, authors of that chapter. We 
analyzed, thanks to Men Library actually, because we used this electronic access to all of the journals and uh, I bothered librarians. It was like two years ago, maybe I can't remember remotely or was here. I bothered librarians with a lot of interlibrary loans and copying stuff from uh, which you can find in some library far away and no electronic copy. So it was really great to have uh, support of the library. Otherwise, we couldn't have done this job. Anyways, we look at different urban EE programs and what, according to their goals, we try to classify them in different trends. Uh, one trend or thread in environmental urban environmental education is using it to learn about science, about nature. Um, for example, Cornell Lab, Labor, Laboratory of Ornithology has a great example, citizen science, such as celebrate urban birds. It, it fits here really well. Another trend in urban environmental education is problem solving. So many, many organizations are just trying to use environmental education to solve acute, really strong, huge environmental problems. Asthma, pollution, lack of green space. Some uh, environmental education programs in cities are trying to use uh, educational activity for long-term and sustained stewardship in those communities, in community gardens, in parks. We also have uh, tons of uh, programs in cities that maybe are not so interested in environmental education per se, but they're interested in positive use development and community development, and they just use urban environmental education as a tool. So to keep students uh, like off streets, but more like busy and doing something positive. It makes a huge positive change in their character. And finally, we see that uh, urban environmental education is trying to reimagine, rethink how we construct, build our cities, uh, create, uh, apply new technologies, uh, um, develop new infrastructure, involve uh, students in communication with ur urban planners and developers. So to create a new image of the city. All right. Any questions so far? Well, uh, okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, I didn't see like a very uh, fast flow of the water there, and it's canal. It's not like a river. So, in the, if you look, there's a what's the English Thames? What do you call Thames? And north of it, there's like a plenty of canals that connect uh, different neighborhoods. They used to be like for trading, for I don't know, for different reasons. So they are semi-natural. Uh, Yeah, that would be it next time in there. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them, what's this? Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's still, yeah, maybe it's indicative of some environmental problems. Maybe there's too much phosphorus or poll pollutants, uh, so there's overgrowth. But maybe it's normal. It's more like mere or like bog or something like that. Maybe it's a state that's desired. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So in those categories you just showed, where would the idea of individual and public health fit in? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I really like this question. We thought that mostly, and we actually wanted at some point to rename this uh, category from individual and community development to maybe uh, we didn't know what's the term the best, development of human capital of human well-being, etc. But uh, a great question because, again, you point to how to use env environmental education, but maybe not so for environmental outcomes per se, but we care more about humans, their well-being, health, positive, the character, development of their character. So it would feel, fit quite well here. Um, all right, um, I'm ready to go to three main themes that we've learned from all the chapters. And they relate to three words that start with P, place, participation, and partnerships. So those themes you can find in most of the chapters. Place, 
Well, most chapters feature this strong connection between place and uh, inhabitants of, uh, uh, and how, they, how people care about those places. I want to give just a super quick example in the, uh, from what I experienced in the Bronx, and I think we reflected in one of the chapters. I met this teenager. She grew up on, uh, in the pro in so-called projects, very high building residential developments in New York City, in the Bronx. So in a very high floor, uh, maybe let's say 20th floor. She looked out the floor of her window when she grew up and she saw East River there, maybe Bronx River there, but she never felt it's part of your community because uh, the access to rivers, especially East River was uh, fences and uh, railways, you cannot go there. But after participation in this environmental education programs. Well, she went to row on a boat and actually, she actually participated in building those boats, uh, planting oysters in the river and also taking community members on the community road rides. So she really felt, oh, the Bronx River is part of my place. This, the Bronx and the river and nature is part of me. It's part of this location, part of this place. So huge transition in how you perceive the place. Participation can be uh, hands-on, um, stewardship activities. They're so often featured in any urban EE programs. But also another meaningful participation is through advocacy or community activism when you try to inform other community members about uh, what's going on in your city or you sit together and have a, a discussion and decide what improvements your community needs. Partnerships among, well, urban environmental education benefits uh, often from partnerships among educators, community members, uh, representatives from the government, um, community leaders, uh, professional environmental educators, and just any uh, environmental leaders in, in communities. When you have a network of people who, are really, who really care about the environment, it's, uh, it just uh, makes everybody much stronger. You exchange resources. Uh, information or maybe you apply for grants together but also when you get different people working together on urban environmental education you can also produce maybe new types of knowledge or new ways of solving environmental education environmental problems all right and uh, I think that eventually this book helps us uh, this journey by for writing this book for a year or a little bit more. It helped us to redefine what urban environmental education is, or maybe not redefine, define uh, what urban environmental education is. And we see that urban environmental education includes diverse practices in cities. This is what we learned. It's not just uh, like, for example, taking care of pollution or measuring or learning about birds and trees. It's also positive use development and green urbanism. Urban environmental education creates new knowledge, creates innovation for the cities. And again, it's, it's interesting because we think, uh, or at least traditionally think that education is transferring or passing down knowledge. In this case, no, it's a development of new knowledge and development of innovation. And finally, through environmental education in cities, we reimagine what cities are, reimagine the, uh, their image, how they function, how they should be organized, and who should be involved and uh, take decisions. Before, after those acknowledgements that I will say, I will have two announcements. Uh, so, but first, some acknowledgements. So first, I'd like to thank all authors of this book and authors of forward or af and afterward, they've done a phenomenal job. I think I learned a great lesson of uh, working with a huge number of people from so many countries, uh, working together towards one book. It was really great. I hope that I will have another experience like this in, uh, in the future. And uh, Cornell University Press has done a great, great, great job. It was so much, uh, uh, it's just a huge pleasure to work with them, and Kitty Leo, especially, she's the editor at Comstock uh, Publishing Associates within the press. So if you ever write a book uh, with Cornell uh, Press, you will have 
you will scream out, out of you know enjoyment. <laughs> it's going to be really, really great. So really, really great to work with them. And I think that now Marion is publishing more books with them. Um, every year she published maybe another book or two. This shows that this collaboration is great. And Higher Education Press in China got interested in this book. Now they are translating it. And Alibaba Foundation, I think they funded already the translation. So we will look forward for a, to send a copy to Man Library written in Chinese language. Maybe a year, <laughs> next year. Um, I would like to thank really Buffalo Street Books for representing uh, and bringing books here. And uh, so thank you so much uh, for uh, bringing those books here. I hope that we will show the support for our community store by purchasing the book and support for the, uh, for the book and environmental education. And finally, thank you, Main Library, everybody who organized this technology. It finally runs really well. And, uh, and for this beautiful environment and uh, the food and uh, great welcome. Thank you so much. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, actually, uh, so I want to say again, the book is available down there. And uh, this week we launched a course, online course, Urban Environmental Education, which whose structure follows the book. You can also sign up for this course, it's not too late. By before tomorrow morning, you can do it. We've got uh, more than 300 people from I'm sure from more than 30 countries in this course already. So if you would like to take it again, you have a chance to sign up. The course is six weeks or seven weeks. At the end, you will receive a Cornell certificate. Um, Annie Armstrong is one of our co-instructors and helpers and uh, uh, yeah, coordinates TAs in this course. Thank you, Annie. Um, all right. Thank you very much again. And now Mary and Krasne and maybe with me, we are happy to take maybe some more questions or make some additional comments. And you have a microphone, Mary, right? Oh, OK. Uh, just a silly one. Is the Bronx where you taught high school? Uh, I taught high school in Siberia, in Tomsk. What did you do in Bronx? In Bronx, so I stayed in the Bronx for two years and uh, to conduct, to collect the data for my PhD. But it was more like uh, not just me getting there and grabbing the data and publishing my dissertation for, just for my benefit. For one year, I lived uh, to volunteer with those environmental education programs. So when they had a community role, for example, I would help them to co-organize uh, this. I think it really may help me to get an insight into what urban environmental education is and kind of walk in their shoes of local people. It was kind of interesting because uh, in experience because in those neighborhoods, many people, if not most people, speak Spanish. And when I walk there, and uh, you know, I would look a little bit different from the majority of people in those places. So people would remember me, and I learned Spanish also uh, by taking courses here and also living with. Uh, a family from Puerto Rico who uh, moved to New York City. Um, yeah, so ex uh, a year of experiences and building relationships with the local community and then doing surveys and interviews. When you go to these places, you need to build trust. So um, especially for interviews, like more in-depth narrative interviews when you gather stories from people, how they, why did they become environmental educators, how they conduct, what problems they have, how, how they teach about place. They will not really readily open up for you everything that's in their heart. So you need to stay there for some time and help them and participate, show that you care, and then they're more open to welcome you and help you with your dissertation. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I was curious. One of your slides mentioned about building a sustainable city, but I guess I was wondering what your perspective of in terms of a resilient city, mm -hmm. because I think in especially in New York City, they are they're 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 they are thinking about resilience in many spectrums, including mm -hmm. climate, and so I was that was. I was wondering what your take on that 
in integrating in urban environmental education. Thank you so much. What's your name? <laughs> um, I'm Helen Chang, and I actually work in New York City. <laughs> oh, which borough? Or? Um, so I'm part of uh, New York Sea Grants, and oh, um, we oh. I'm the Coastal Resilience Extension Specialist, mm. mostly concentrating uh, my work in Jamaica Bay, which encompasses Southern, Queen, uh, Southern Queens and Southern Brooklyn. That's amazing. Well, first, I, I hope that we'll get a co you will get a copy of our book and we'll happy be, will be to sign. It's a lot of relevant to your work. But your question is so amazing. I really love it because uh, some people in our lab are working a lot on climate change and with uh, the hurricane, I forgot, what's the name of the hurricane that hit uh, Sandy? Yes, and uh, you know, maybe Marian actually can answer a little bit more than I do especially related to urban and resilience. Marion worked a lot with the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, those people infor informed a lot of how we're thinking about resilience, right? Yeah, so thanks for your question, Helen. Mm -hmm. um, actually, after Hurricane Sandy, I worked with, there was somebody who was working with me doing civic ecology research, Bryce Dubois, maybe you know Bryce, and he, um, we went, he went around and interviewed about 30 educators. Sounds like you know his work, but, and we wanted to know how are they responding to Hurricane Sandy because I think climate change and events like Hurricane Sandy, they sort of force you to question what you're doing. It's not just, you know, people want it, they need to adapt, right? And if they're gonna do sea walls, big sea wells, that's one way to adapt, not very environmental friendly. If they're gonna do oyster restoration reefs to try to provide soft barriers, it might be more environmental friendly. So, but we were just wanting to know how people are thinking about environmental education in light of the event and what it says about climate change. So the interesting thing was that all these educators talked about resilience. I don't know if it was because of the, you know, Jamaica Bay Resilience Center, um, but they all talked about it at different levels. So we had, the person, Bridget from TNC, she the Nature Conservative, she talked about grit and students' individual resilience. There's all that grit stuff out of University of Pennsylvania that was getting a lot of uh, publicity at that point. And you know, all the way up through community resilience, things like we, if we put solar panels on a shed in a community garden, we'll have somewhere to go to charge our phones after an event. Um, the Jamaica Bay people talked more about what we would call ecological resilience, and then other people we felt they were talking about sort of mixed social ecological resilience. So I think environmental education has a role because at least, I mean, I don't think this is widespread, but at least in New York City, people are thinking about this resilience. The Big U was part of that. Um, and um, I think that like the main lesson for me is that any sort of adaptation resilience because of our field and our goals, it, we really need to think about how the adaptation can be ecosystem-based or community-based adaptation so that's consistent with environmental values and community values. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, my second question is, uh, I mean, I saw a lot of the photos were mostly students or kids, um, and uh, I guess, you know, they, they don't have this ability to vote or, you know, partake in the voting process, and so how do you make that connection of that students are, real, uh, are empowered to make a decision even though they don't have that ability to formally vote yet? Does that, does that make sense mm -hmm. in terms of the question? Yeah, so basically you're asking whether and how do students have power and ability to make some changes in this world, whether they're like political or on the ground, right? Well, maybe not so much political, like they, yes, you said, you answered the question, they cannot uh, vote. Uh, they still, in this, in terms of adv advocacy, they still can inform community members about what's going on in the neighborhood, and thus those commu older community members who have more power, they can make changes. 
So I observed students, they would create uh, like flyers that they would attach on the poles like everywhere on the community. Or they uh, will create urban, um, like some, paint something on the walls uh, that informs communities through art about what's going on. So this will create public opinion, what should be changed, uh, what problems we face and uh, what has to be done. So it's in a part of advocacy and informing community. Oh, Marion, you wanna add something? Yes, go ahead. Um, through our online courses, and we have a series of five courses we offer, we have a lot of Chinese students. Usually about half our students are from China. So this issue comes up a lot because, you know, people in the U.S. are demonstrating, or what, including kids, right? But not in China. So, in fact, we were on a webinar this morning and a Chinese student asked us this mm -hmm. question. And I think that um, it's interesting because we have a lot of university environmental club members who take our courses. And one of the leaders of um, Environmental Club, and she's actually helped us, she, she works with us, she helps translate and do other things. But, um, you know, they are able to, say, work within that particular setting, and she, they were able to influence dorm recycling policies, for example. So same as a kid might be able to work in a high school, and make, you know, there's examples of uh, high school students who have uh, convince their school to change the bus or the car idling policy so that there's not as many cars sitting out there, you know, picking up and leaving students and um, creating exhaust. So I think you can apply some of these advocacy principles in different settings depending on the context in which somebody's working or living. And then New York City, I've also heard from uh, teachers, uh, from educators that they teach to students, like high school students, that they, when you go to your like representatives, uh, local in the, in the Bronx and your government, the government, they said your government in the Bronx, they are, I don't know what's the word, not are afraid of kids, but they're, you know, they feel like kids represent a big voice. And if they come to your office, like a group of kids, and they said, we need a bus that runs from this, like, city, uh, from the Bronx Center to that uh, far away park that it's otherwise not uh, ac accessible too far, or we need uh, to establish uh, this little park on, on instead of this uh, vacant lot. So those politicians will actually listen to kids. <laughs> that was an experience that I've heard from uh, educators. Yes, and also like on the ground changes, you can do so much, a lot, just by doing physical improvements in your community. Another question. Um, I thought it was really interesting how you came from Siberia, where there's that one picture where it's just like trees, and mm. there's nothing there. And what's your name? And where uh, my name's Tim. I'm a grad student in, mass, in uh, landscape architecture and regional planning. Oh, and where uh, are you? Coming from? I'm from Geneseo, which is like two hours west of here, a real small oh. town, like 3,000 oh. people. Awesome. Um, and I'm actually, it kind of pertains to my question because I'm from outside of the town, so I grew up around fields and stuff like that. And I'm kind of wondering how or the role that environmental education would play in like helping people realize their relationship not only to like their local context of like this is my neighborhood but also like this is where my food comes from and these are where my clothes come from and like all these like little things that make up their lives that are actually from like very far away mm -hmm. uh what, what's like the i don't know what are your thoughts on that yes that's an excellent question food miles uh, it's a big uh, topic in uh, in urban environmental education like buy local and eat lo local especially if you're in food deserts and how you're, but there's a, a lot of really fresh food just a few miles from there. I had a very interesting talk, I think yesterday or uh, a couple of days ago with Danny, who is a grad student in our lab, and he is uh, looking at something overlapping, uh, that uh, how we frame environmental messages and how they, can you say just a couple of words and maybe you can answer how this can be related to urban environmental education. Basically, we can, can frame a mes environmental messages that you, you've done some right, analysis. Sure, yeah. I don't know if I can make the, the, the connection explicitly to education per se, but um, um, but the, uh, the basic idea is that any 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 environmental problem can be framed in sort of local terms, um, uh, in terms of its localized impact, or or you can make connection to sort of broader structural issues, um, um, and frame it globally. And like you know, for a long long time. We've been in, environmentalists implore each other to like think locally, or think globally, act locally. Um, 
but I, I mean, I think there's there, there's there's a tension there, and 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 like really stems from agency. You know, uh, it's harder to have impact globally. So most of, I mean, my exp my understanding reading, um, my colleagues' work is that um, where students feel empowered is is, you know, sort of seeing the, the real seeing and really realizing like um, the impacts of the work on a local scale. Um, I personally am interested in how we think about them globally, conceptually, but um, a lot of examples and 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 and. Um, books that our lab has have produced, I think are really powerful um, in that they show the power of that kind of local action and how, I, I mean, I think physical engagement with like civic ecology practices can help make that cognitive connection. But I mean, I think what you're talking about is, is like ultimately more of like an, you know, an intellectual dilemma and I don't, you know, and I think Danny will continue grad's uh, work uh, as for PhD. And he, will, he said he will actually answer this question in a few years. Like, what is a uh, like global message or local message is more um, uh, powerful? Actually, it's for you a question. When you go to today home, and whether your friends or family, whoever is there, you will say, OK, let's stop using plastic bags. Whether it's going to be more effective to say that it fills up our landfills uh, wherever it is, outside of Ithaca, Ithaca or in Pennsylvania, like it's local impact, let's stop using it. Or you can frame a message as this is going to go end up eventually some of this plastic in uh, uh, ocean and it's going to be in stomachs of those uh, fish and mammals in, in the sea. So how to frame this message and what's more effective to change this behavior? Mm -hmm. We still, we're exploring. Danny is gonna answer that in five years. <laughs> um, but a great question. I think uh, maybe for now to be safe, a combination of those uh, global and local messages would work in cities and elsewhere and in small towns like your. Thank you. And the question. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to see a book like this uh, come out because I, I think there's a widespread perception in the U.S. that there isn't really much nature in cities. So you can't mm -hmm. teach people who live there about nature. There yes. aren't examples. And I think everybody in this room knows that that's wrong. And um, so I'm really glad to see this. I mean, you mentioned the Lab of Ornithology. I used to work there. And so um, I remember a, a talk that was given there uh, specifically about the importance of Central Park for bird migration. Mm -hmm. People have a perception, and again, this part of that, right. as I just mentioned, that, well, birds don't land in cities. They look for natural areas. Central Park's incredibly important for bird migration. And there are enormous numbers that land there all the time. They, they go right for it. So, um, so it's just one of many examples for why this, this Absolutely. perception is false. And so... Um, Anyways, it's just great to see that uh, there's now a, a much wider understanding that cities are very valuable for. Yeah, thank you. So this is a great comment. Actually, one of the pictures, I don't know if you had, I said it was from Central Park, this Celebrate Urban Birds, actually. The launch of Celebrate Ur Urban Birds, maybe I took this picture maybe t more than 10 years ago, in Central Park. Uh, Centr oh, it's a mirror, uh, Central Park mirror. I can't remember what was the name. Harlem Mir, yes, on the center, uh, and on the north of the of the Central Park, yes, so many birds and bird watchers with binoculars and uh, identifiers uh, for birds. They, they uh, tons of forests, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. How, does that, how do you deal with that access? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as a, um, just one example, I wanted to remind on the Bronx River where uh, educators um, from, okay, just, educators from a positive youth development program in the Bronx, uh, they involved students in the uh, rallying or like petitions and protests uh, and informing the community that there was lack of access to the river. So people live there just a few feet from there. There's a river nobody knows. Local people sometimes in years ago you would ask is there any nature or like what is there Bronx River? Like what is Bronx River? Always like right there. So those 
positive youth development program uh, with high school students. They work with the government uh, uh, and open this park eventually on, instead of a former industrial site. It's just one example of many. There's many more examples where formal industrial sites are being turned with the help of community and there's a role of urban environmental education. But there's also pocket sites. You don't have to go large. There's small spaces just, um, and I think Marian mentioned in Mythica, there's like you walk somewhere and there's like cross roads and there's like little pockets like triangle or something. And there's beautiful, nice, you will see oak cabbage and there's a tree and there's maybe vegetables and flowers. It's already, uh, you show um, that you care about this place and it's educational. You can put some interpretation or key, bring some kids uh, after school, during school, etc. So there's plentiful opportunities, vacant lots. So yeah, you're correct. It's not only about Central Park. We need to go small and local and uh, very close to people as well. Great question. Maybe Marion has some. Yeah, I just wanted to re reinforce what Alex had said that actually, um, it's actually in 1998 that I visited my first community garden in, in the Lower East Side, and that's how I got very interested in doing environmental education in cities. And in the Lower East Side, there at that, in that Alphabet Soup neighborhood, there's like a community garden practically every neighborhood, which really reflect the changes in the, neighbor in the neighborhood demographics, like from more upscale to, uh, you know, sort of more Puerto Rican gardens down closer to the East River. Anyway, I think the point is Alex mentioned park at parks, there's street tree planting. So there's a lot of community-based initiatives to create little pockets of nature. And one of the things we've done through our outreach and, and our research also is tried to foster these practices, support them, and also understand them. That's how we got the, the idea of doing civic ecology to sort of as a name for these community-based stewardship projects. So I think it's not just the parks. Like when Alex was in the Bronx, you, I remember a community garden I visited with you, a bioswale garden that students were uh, constructing along the river. You have slides of tree planting. So there's a lot of little nature, just like our mayor's little um, uh, parking <laughs> space. I think he's converted it into a little green space um, that I think are important in these settings. Mm -hmm. I have a microphone. <laughs> We can take just one more, or two questions, three, yeah. Super, super, two super quick questions. Hi, uh, I'm Cinnamon. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Ecology and Evolution. Um, and I study um, invasive species. And your story kind of, um, it was similar to my own. I lived somewhere really rural growing up, and now I work in Miami studying invasive species, which is <laughs> not where I thought I would be. Um, but something that I think, I'm just now getting into this like urban environmental education type of uh, thing because I visit classrooms and stuff occasionally when I'm in Miami. And one thing that I th have started to think about, and I wonder if there's anything in your book that addresses this, and um, I think this links back to the question you're just answering, is when you're thinking about uh, green spaces in a city, a lot of this uh, Organisms that are there are invasive, mm -hmm. and as someone who studies and appreciates invasive <laughs> species, I feel like sometimes it's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. But um, how do you think about that, or how do you talk about like a green space that's not necessarily like a quote-unquote natural space right, that right, people right. usually think of? Yeah. Can I relate uh, the uh, actually the book cover to this question? Do you know what this picture is? High Line, yes, that's a famous High Line in New York City. And do you know which plants, like locally invasive, they tried to plant there? They went, tried to do local, yeah, local plants uh, from like that part of New York, New York and New York City, uh, no invasives. Uh, well, there was a, a lot of uh, criticism in, in, the, in the approach how High Line like didn't really involve the community, and then it caused gentrific gentrification, etc. So, but they do take good steps for uh, educating people. So, so local. Uh, I don't have really specific like super preference whether you should go local or uh, invasive or like different species. Maybe both have some place and benefits uh, for for the environment. Uh, in cities. We still don't understand fully, I think, like from the biological side, what are the implications of uh, going non-local, uh, like is it like what's going to be in the long term, like with GMO, so I don't have an answer. 
but I've seen that uh, there's a lot of efforts that urban environmental education is trying to eradicate uh, those that go really wild, those uh, invasives that really remove the local ecosystems and uh, are not so good for animals and birds. I, does it answer your question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, but it would be great to have your opinion and your view maybe with some environmental groups because you studied this uh, problem. And people like you will be often welcomed in urban environmental education programs to inform our decisions and what we do. Thank you. It just shows that urban environmental education encompass, uh, like integrates so many di different ideas. Uh, you cannot have answers for everything. You draw on opinions and uh, research of experts as well. So you bring them to community often. Thank you. And there's another last question today. Oh, did you? Yes, you wanted. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can you tell us a little bit about the process for selecting 82 co-authors to provide content for that for your book? It sounds oh. like a big job. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. Do you remember how we've done it? <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I know that, that we're running a little over time, but uh -huh. Alex, as he mentioned, had traveled around the world for a year, and he met people all over the world that, doing environmental education. He mentioned Brazil. He reached out to the people that had sponsored him at the University of Brazil and added them as, cha as chapter authors, and because he really wanted to have at least one international, non, you know, Europe-centric, North American-centric author for each chapter. So a lot of it was just that philosophy guiding and then different contexts that he and I had made. And it was really challenging because, for example, on one chapter I worked with a South African author on community environmental education. And her definition was home health care workers and how they dispose medical waste. I didn't think that was necessarily what I might call environmental education, but I think that was Alex's, you know, amazing vision that I had to expand the way I defined it, by working with people. So um, it was really tough. I was really mad at my co-authors many times. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it was an, you know, an important vision for not just presenting the same old perspective. In my sense of place chapter that I co-authored, so I come more from the environmental psychology field and to link sense of place and ecological place meaning with your pro-environmental behavior. However, my colleagues, uh, Jennifer Adams from Brooklyn College, uh, uh, CUNY, New York, she comes more th from the critical uh, framework where, uh, about power, so pl how place empowers you, or like she talks about immigrants who came from Caribbean islands to migrated to New York, and they bring seeds of those plants that they used to plant, and they want to recreate that place and identity in New York City. So that we merge those two different concepts to talk about place and sense of place in the city. So again, this is a power of uh, combining people with totally different frameworks uh, where they come to write those chapters. Okay, I would like to thank everybody again. Thank you so much. Again, you show, by coming here, I think you show your community and your environmental leadership uh, good luck in whatever you do and do something good for the environment. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.